Temperature shifts directly disrupt the neuroendocrine control of reproduction. It messes with the signals along the brain pituitary gonad axis. So in simple terms, the heat is sending the wrong hormonal signals. Fundamentally, it impairs maturation, it messes up spawning timing, and it just tanks the quality of the gametes. If you can't get viable eggs and sperm, the whole pipeline shuts down. And the review mentioned an even stranger effect in the offspring. The functional masculinization. Yes. In a key species like Nile tilapia, elevated temperatures at just the right moment in early development can actually change the sex of the fish. That introduces chaos into your stocking plans. Complete chaos. A whole new era of communication in the global aquaculture industry is coming. Now you have the brightest minds in aquaculture right in your pocket. And what's best? You can listen to all of them while driving to a farm, traveling, or running errands. It's never been this good, and it's never been this simple. Welcome to the Aquaculture Podcast Show, the first AI-based podcast in aquaculture, where you'll find cutting-edge insights in everything that's working in aquaculture, nutrition, health, and production. Inspired by the 2023 article titled, An Overview of the Implication of Climate Change on Fish Farming in Egypt by Merim AI. Welcome back. Today, we're jumping straight into one of the biggest operational challenges facing aquaculture, climate volatility. We're seeing the sector grow at an incredible pace. It's the fastest growing food sector, period. Projections have it hitting, what, 62% of the global aquatic food supply by 2030. The scale is just immense. And with that scale comes exposure. So the question is how high output regions can actually secure their operations against, you know, these rapidly shifting environmental baselines. It's moved way beyond theory. It's an immediate operational reality now. Exactly. To ground this, we're focusing on Egypt. We're digging into the 2023 review by Merim and Rife, which really lays bare the implications of climate change on fish farming there. A perfect case study. Egypt is Africa's largest producer. Mm -hmm. I mean, they supply something like 80.5% of their own domestic fish, so they're incredibly successful. But that success is built on some very uh, tenuous resources. Extremely. So our mission here isn't just to say it's getting warmer. We're doing a technical evaluation of the immediate physical impacts on production inputs. The water, the feed, the seed stock. Right. And then we'll get into the advanced integrated systems required for adaptation, especially in these resource-constrained environments. Why Zenetics turns podcast airtime into brand authority. We don't sell ads, we elevate voices. Curious how far your voice can go to become a reference in the industry and attract more leads? Scan the QR code and discover how we can turn your expertise into unmatched brand authority. Let's transform expertise into influence, starting now. Okay, let's set the scene with the sheer scale of production in Egypt. The growth has been explosive. Farmed area went from 42,000 hectares in 99 to over 123,000 by 2019. And that's a $3.2 billion market value. It's a massive economic engine. But the production model is changing, right? It's not all traditional ponds anymore. Not at all. While semi-intensive systems are still the bulk of it, maybe 80%, the industry is pushing hard toward intensive cultures. So you're talking concrete ponds, tank culture, cages. And that shift to intensive farming just completely changes the risk profile, doesn't it? It does. Your capital costs go way up. And more importantly, your operational costs pivot almost entirely to formulated feeds. That's 40 to 60% of your total cost right there. Which brings us to the most critical constraint, the water itself. Why is it so constrained? I mean, they have the Nile. You'd think so. But direct use of Nile water for aquaculture is heavily restricted. Policy reasons, water security. So farmers are forced to rely on, frankly, poor quality agricultural drainage water. And the numbers on that are staggering. They are. About 78% of farmers are using that runoff. So you're starting with water that's already loaded with residual fertilizers, salts, you name it. A built-in disadvantage from day one. It's a direct feedback loop to production loss. The Merriman Reefe review is clear on this. It drives up costs because you have to treat the water, it reduces yields, and it dramatically increases disease outbreaks. So you have that fragile baseline, and then you layer on climate variability. Let's talk physics, rising water temperatures. Two immediate effects. First, the basic one. Mm -hmm. Warmer water just holds less dissolved oxygen, period. Right. Second, and this is the dangerous part, the warmer water simultaneously speeds up the fish's metabolic rate. So they need more oxygen, but there's less oxygen available. Precisely. It's a classic physiological squeeze. It leads to higher mortality, wasted feed, 
and just makes the entire stock more vulnerable to any pathogen that's present. And beyond heat, there's the salinity issue. How does that work? Rising sea levels. The Mediterranean pushes salt water further up the Nile Delta, and it also salinizes coastal groundwater. It's a direct physical threat that can just wipe out freshwater aquaculture in those low-lying areas. Okay, so the water is under acute stress. Let's pivot to the feed. You said it's 40 to 60% of costs. The value chain here is a huge point of exposure. It's a profound one. Egypt imports between 50 and 99% of its aquafeed raw materials. So their domestic production is completely vulnerable to global markets. And those global markets are vulnerable to climate. Think about it. The core of high quality feed is fish meal which comes from capture fisheries. Which are impacted by things like El Nino. Exactly. A major El Nino event in the Pacific can cause extreme price volatility for an Egyptian farmer months later. It creates this urgent need to find sustainable alternatives, algae, plant-based proteins. But there's a trap there too, isn't there? The alternatives like soy and corn are also threatened by climate change through drought and heat waves. It's a dual threat. You're almost trading one climate risk for another. The only real way forward is resilient local sourcing, but that's a huge R&D lift. Let's move from commodities to biology to the seed stock itself. Temperature stress here is acting on a, uh, on a cellular level. It is. The mechanism is fascinating. Temperature shifts directly disrupt the neuroendocrine control of reproduction. It messes with the signals along the brain pituitary gonad axis. So in simple terms, the heat is sending the wrong hormonal signals. Fundamentally, it impairs maturation, it messes up spawning timing, and it just tanks the quality of the gametes. If you can't get viable eggs and sperm, the whole pipeline shuts down. And the review mentioned an even stranger effect in the offspring. The functional masculinization. Yes. In a key species like Nile tilapia, Elevated temperatures at just the right moment in early development can actually change the sex of the fish. That introduces chaos into your stocking plans. Complete chaos. Now, hatcheries already try to manage seasonality with heaters or by using warmer groundwater to get a jump on the season. But that's a tactical fix for a predictable problem. It's not a strategy for continuous warming. Which means the entire sector has to pivot away from open, environment-dependent systems. And towards advanced, controlled, integrated infrastructure. It's really non-negotiable. Let's talk about those solutions. The most established has to be recirculating aquaculture systems. The bunker system, right? RAS gives you a biosecure, totally controlled environment. It basically eliminates the impact from external factors like floods, droughts, heat spikes. And it's incredibly water efficient. We're talking 80 to 99% reuse. Perfect for a water scarce region. Mm. But we have to be honest about the trade-off. You're trading environmental risk for energy dependence. And capital costs. And huge capital costs. Mm -hmm. The energy required to run the pumps and filtration 24 seven is significant. And the upfront investment is often just too high for smaller producers. Okay, so what's another route? The paper talks a lot about bioflock technology. BFT is exciting because it reframes waste as a resource. The basic idea is you control the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the water by adding a carbon source, like molasses. And that encourages a specific type of biological growth. Exactly. It stimulates the growth of heterotrophic microorganisms. These microorganisms then consume the toxic nitrogenous waste from the fish and convert it into microbial protein which the fish then eat. Right. You're cleaning the water and creating a supplemental feed source at the same time. For tilapia, this can supply up to 50% of their dietary protein needs, all while operating at near zero water exchange. It tackles the water and feed problems simultaneously. It does. Then you have the fully integrated systems like aquaponics, a perfect symbiotic loop. Fish waste provides nutrients for hydroponically grown plants. And the plants act as a natural biofilter cleaning the water before it goes back to the fish. And you get two high-value crops, fish, and produce with massive water conservation. It's incredibly efficient. Taking that idea of integration even further, we get to Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture, or IMTA. This is environmental engineering. It really is. You co-cultivate your main finfish crop with species from other trophic levels. Think nutrient absorbers like seaweeds and deposit feeders like sea cucumbers. So every waste stream becomes an input for another commercial crop. That's the design. The seaweeds pull dissolved nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus out of the water, preventing eutrophication. And the deposit feeders. They handle the solid waste. They eat the fecal matter and uneaten feed that sinks to the bottom, preventing the sediment from going hypoxic. It's a beautifully designed closed loop system. 
So to pull this all together, the paradigm shift is clear. Moving from open traditional systems to these closed loop integrated models is the only path forward for resilience. Absolutely. And for the technical stakeholders, the long-term play has to be in genetics. We need a major investment in developing new fish strains with higher tolerance for both salinity and heat. And diversifying the species we farm. For sure. Diversifying into more inherently heat-resistant species, mm -hmm. like the African catfish, which has a much larger thermal window than tilapia. Yeah. That just spreads your biological risk. So resilience requires a massive shift in tech, genetics, and strategy. But all of that costs money. Let's finish with a provocative thought for our listener. Given that we know these integrated systems recycle waste and reduce the carbon footprint, how should the industry quantitatively measure and standardize the blue carbon sequestration value of these models? Because mm. if you can put an accurate monetizable number on that environmental service. Exactly. If you can monetize it, you create the economic incentive to pull the massive private capital and policy funding needed to build this resilient future. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow the Aquaculture Podcast Show on your favorite platform. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook to stay updated on the latest episodes and industry insights. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.